when you just think about the fact that, you know, a lot of people um, uh, manage to get 3.5 averages, they study every single moment. I was like that. I spent all of my time in the library. And when I see you guys out doing the wonderful work that you're doing with your teams, I know so many of you are involved in other organizations, and yet you uh, achieve this very, very high distinction. Um, and we are very, very proud of you. And it bodes well for your future that you manage your time well. It was when Tony, standing six foot five in his last game, where he averaged 15 points and 12 rebounds per game for two seasons, did his best Kobe Bryant, scoring 47 points versus the University of Redlands, which is today the most points ever scored in a basketball game at this institution. And he made the winning shot, connecting on 22 field goals in that game. Unbelievable accomplishment. So uh, he's going to come up here in a little bit and just talk about what this school meant to him and how athletics was obviously and has been a, a, a tremendous uh, part of his life. Uh, his competitive nature still exists today as he competes for the Los Angeles Lightning pro basketball franchise out of the IBL. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up Senator Anthony Tony Sherman. Probably one of my most proudest moments uh, in my lifetime. You know, I've, I've, other than my kids being born and being married, you know, playing here at Whittier College was just a tremendous opportunity. And the one thing that was left out, the first ever poet classic, uh, we played BAPS in college <laughs> in Massachusetts. And they were ranked in the country. And we were able, and again, you know, my former uh, head coach, Coach Jacobs, uh, was originally from Massachusetts, and he wanted to play the top team right away. And we won by a last second shot. That wasn't designed for me, by the way. It was a, a broken up play. And I took the ball, and I had confidence at the time, so I took the last shot, and we ended up winning the game on a buzzer beater. You couldn't write a better script. And I have to say, my life has been sort of like that script. Um, I thank God every day, um, and, and the blessings I've had uh, growing up, but there's no place that I'm more proud of to be a part of than Whittier College. Um, everybody, as I was driving here, um, you think about people who've really meant the world to you that really shape the direction of your future in your life. And um, one person's right here, uh, it was asked of me why I decided to come to Whittier College, because you know, all of us athletes always you know, aim high. That's, that's who we are. And I always thought I was gonna play some big you know, D1 Pac-10 school, Pac school, or a big D1 school, but when I got a letter uh, from Whittier College, uh, I knew Richard Nixon went here. And I was interested in political science and politics. And I opened it up. I was really excited to come on my campus visit. And then Coach Jacobs and Coach Carter um, actually showed me around the campus. And I, I fell in love with this campus the minute I walked a step foot on this campus. It was the best decision I ever made. Um, going back to those inspirations, Coach Jacobs, God rest his soul, uh, was an amazing inspiration to me. Pushed me to the limit. And um, that helps you whatever you want to do, whether if you want to be a nurse, uh, whether you want to be in professional athletics, whether you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, whatever your goals are in life, um, I don't know how you can get there without being an athlete. Because coaches like Coach Carter and Coach Jacobs push you to your limit. And you learn more about yourself um, when you can dig down deep and get that extra shot out or play that extra time in defense. Uh, I'm using basketball analogies, but I know a lot of you play soccer and other sports. But there's always been a moment when you've been playing with your team where your team is, your whole team is relying on you to make the play. And you dig down deep even though you're tired and you get that done. And uh, that's what life is about. Life is about being confident in your capabilities and to dig down deep and, and go that extra mile. All of you obviously do that, that you're here today because not only do you have your responsibilities on the, <coughs> on the court and the field uh, of athletics, but you're doing it in the classroom. Uh, you're going to be the champions moving forward. And if there's one thing I can leave with you today, if you remember one thing in my speech, is don't ever let someone tell you you can't accomplish your goals. Because uh, I've been underestimated my whole life. And I, I just turned you know, a little over 40. Um, I still feel like I'm in my 20s. And it's really amazing when I'm also driving here, uh, 
that uh, a lot of you uh, student athletes uh, were probably born when I graduated here from Whittier College. So you know, it seems like yesterday, but obviously it, it wasn't yesterday. And um, by the way, 1992-93. Uh, any of you born around that time? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> thanks, thanks. It really makes me feel good. No. But. Um, you know, and going back to those inspirations, uh, I had inspirations in the classroom too. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Fred Bergerson, uh, who was an amazing professor in political science, really challenged me in the classroom. Uh, and I love the class to this day. It was one of my best classes I ever had. Uh, talk about Congress. And then uh, Dr. Richard B. Harvey, who has also passed away, but he was a professor here. He actually did this uh, class called Politics Beyond the Classroom in our January interim. I don't know if you still do those January interims or not. But we went to Sacramento, and uh, it was amazing because Dr. Harvey actually brought a class of Whittier College students up, uh, and I got to show them around, take them out to dinner, and so on and so forth. So it was kind of a circle of life, and it's really inspiring for me to be here. But again, going back to that uh, moment uh, where you don't want someone to talk you out of your goals and your dreams. Uh, the, the thing that upsets me the most is when people say, oh, you can't accomplish that, or you can't do this, or you can't do that. If I had a nickel for every person that told me I was too young when I first decided to run for the state legislature, uh, I would have been rich. I can't tell you how many people said I was 26 when I announced that I was going to run for assembly. I got elected when I was 27. And, um, you know, I was running against a gentleman who was planning research director for Governor Pete Wilson. He was a partner of a law firm and CEO of a toy company. And on paper, he went to Harvard um, and, and, you know, he went to uh, Berkeley. Uh, graduate school, and on paper, he should have beat me. But I believed in myself, and I did something that all of us need to do, is, is dig deep in, and I went door to door, and I did the hard work that others weren't willing to do. I walked door to door, and I met people eye to eye, and I asked them for the vote, and I told them what I was gonna do, and I followed through, and I did it. And um, I, again, that's uh, something that most people didn't think I had a chance. And I think God tends to open things up for you uh, when you're willing to meet them halfway and work and do the work that you need to do. Um, we, we do these public polling, so uh, we had this poll done, and it, if I could just share a quick story when I was running, you can imagine, I had it. think about this, your, your, your seniors. Um, for the seniors, it was literally five years after I graduated Whittier College, I was in the legislature. So think about five years from now, you would be in the legislature, and that's where people didn't think, they thought I was too young and I couldn't get it done. But I put myself in that position to win, and my opponent, um, it was a tight race uh, in our polling. Uh, I was up one point, but that was a very tight race. It was about two weeks out uh, of election day. And every day I put up my campaign signs, the signs would come down the very next day. And then I put them up, and then the signs would come down the next day. And it was getting really expensive, and we were running a shoestring campaign. Uh, meaning that uh, we didn't have a lot of money to, to keep putting up these signs. So I sent my best volunteer, who was a Pepperdine student at the time. His name is Nick Liswich. He now lives in Washington. And I asked him to do me a favor, to go to the corner sign where the sign went down every day. And I said, videotape this sign all night. <laughs> and then, you know, at least we can find out who's ripping down my signs. So about 4 in the morning, my volunteer called me. He said, I got him, I got him, I got him. I said, who? He said, your opponent. I said, no. I said, bring that back. Bring that back. You know, and so we went in. We saw the video. And it was my opponent ripping down my signs. And, but it was kind of dark. It was really dark. So if you knew it was him, you knew it was him. So the technology was not what it is today. Um, so the next day, we went out and bought night vision camera. <laughs> and then we went to four different signs. And we caught my opponent ripping four of my other signs. Down. Now, we've, now we've caught him five times on video of ripping down my signs. What would you do with that information? Anybody? <laughs> Students, what would you do? <laughs> what would you do? Go ahead. What's your name? <laughs> what? Uh, my name's Peter. Peter, what would you do if you were me? Blackmail. Blackmail. <laughs> like, like what would you do in terms of blackmail? <laughs> maybe show it to him as like, you know, maybe you shouldn't have ripped down my signs anymore. Or? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a different answer than Peter? Go ahead, take a shot. What's your name? Yeah, no, don't turn around. What's your name? My decision, my political campaign. You would what? I'll show it to the people. Show it to the people right away? He's, uh, he's dirty. He's... You So you'd show it right away? Uh, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Hold on. Let me pick. Uh, 
Yeah. You. Over there. Yeah. I think I would let him go first and then possibly take another commercial or something. Okay. <laughs> Anybody interested in what I did? Yeah. Okay. This is what I did. It's called the drop play. It's something I learned uh, from Warren Blackwell, uh, who teaches campaign schools at Leadership Institute in Washington, D.C. What I did was I just accused him of it. And I said, look, my volunteers saw you ripping down my signs uh, with his own two eyes. And all I want is the money back from my, my signs, and then we can call it a day. Well, Rich Seibert uh, thought better of it, and he went after me um, and called me a young punk and said I'm a desperate candidate, so on and so forth. And so the LA Times, as, as they read back what his quote was when I just said, hey, look, I just wanted to pay back um, money uh, for my sides. And I said, well, you're going to run the story to the LA Times. I said, nah, it's kind of he said, she said. I, I don't think we're going to run the story. And I said, well, I don't know if this matters or not. But since you have them on record denying it, um, tomorrow I'll do a press conference with video. And the reporter goes, you got video? <laughs> and the next day, the next day, not only it was in the LA Times, it was on CNN. In fact, uh, Funny's Home Videos paid me for the rights to show that video. <laughs> um, and it was on every major national TV outlet. Now, what was my opponent's biggest mistake? Exactly. And the thing in politics, also in the nursing profession, or anything moving forward for all of you, your words are gone. Your, your words are gone. And, you know, being caught in a lie, people could have gotten over the fact that he ripped down signs. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody. But the fact that he denied it and lied about it. Um, and that's one lesson that all of you should learn that I know for, for a fact. Even if it's an uncomfortable situation, you have to come forward and tell the truth. Because that's your honor. Because people won't trust you moving forward again if they, caught, they catch in a lie. So not only uh, did we win the race, because of that happened, we won overwhelmingly. And then, uh, you can imagine, I was the young, uh, youngest member of the legislature. I was the only member of the legislature who was in their 20s. And I dropped the average age dramatically in the state of <laughs> Most of the members were in their 40s, and I thought that was really old back then, but I think it's really young now. Um, so when I got there, we had this thing called the energy crisis. Anybody know or heard about the energy crisis, the young students, anybody? No? Well, it, during that time, it was a pretty big deal it was, uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. And what happened was, 1999-2000, uh, what, what happened was we had these things called rolling blackouts where we didn't have enough energy. And the governor at the time, Gray Davis, uh, locked us into these long-term power contracts uh, that helped us get through this uh, crisis. They bought these long-term power contracts, but they did it in secret. They didn't uh, disclose how much money we were spending, and they kept the contract secret and hidden. Now, as an elected official, I think it's very important that the people know exactly what's happening, on, happening in their government. And they have a right to know how much money it was costing them to keep the lights on in the state of California. Um, when we spend your money, that's what it is. When, when you're in Washington or in Sacramento, we're spending your money. You have a right to know how much we're, we're spending. So at that time, I asked Governor Gray Davis to release those documents under the public records request. Because I said, this is not your money, it's not my money. It's people's money, and they have the right to know. And he refused at the time. And so I did the only thing I thought I could do at the time. I took him to a court, uh, to court in a lawsuit, Strickland v. Davis. You can Google it today, uh, Strickland v. Davis. And I remember like it was yesterday, and you can visualize this with me. Uh, again, going back to being confident in yourself and doing the right thing. So I walk into my Republican caucus. Uh, we get together once a week, and I walk in, and I said, you know, um, Governor Davis is not disclosing this information. I'm going to take him to court in a lawsuit. Who's with me? And to say I didn't get a warm response is an understatement. In fact, most of my Republican colleagues took me outside after the meeting. They put their arm around me. And they said, you know, Tony, this is the governor of California. If you go forward in this lawsuit, you're going to be in the worst office in the Capitol building. On top of that, um, you're, he's going to veto every piece of legislation you have. And we think you have a bright future. You're going to end your career before it gets started. You're going to end your political career before it gets started. So they try to talk me out of doing it. And at that time, it was gut check time. It really was. Because I knew it was the right thing to do. But now even my Republican colleagues were telling me, don't do this because it will hurt your future. And so you know, I thought about it. And I said, you know, I didn't come here to get elected to go along to get along. I got elected to do the right thing. And that's what I promised people that I would do. 
So not only did we go forward on the lawsuit in the court case, we won. And under court order, the judge ordered Great Apes to release those documents. And what we found out at the time was he locked in these contracts, these 15, 20 year contracts, at a higher price than the worst price during the spot market. We literally saved you, rate payers, energy payers, uh, when you pay your energy costs, when colleges pay their energy costs. It's, it, we saved billions of dollars because we were able to take the governor to court. Now, I'm very proud of that moment because, again, no one was with me at that time, but I ended up being vindicated because I did the right thing. And uh, I'm very proud of that. And going back to where uh, it all began here at Whittier College, you know, I had top notch professors uh, that were role models to me. I had coaches that are role models to, to this day. Um, and this experience here at Whittier College really prepared me to make the most of my life. Now, my dream, ever since I was three years old, ever since I could walk, was to play professional basketball. I thought I gave that up to go into politics. And what was interesting is uh, when I got elected to the state senate, uh, uh, this owner of a team called the Los Angeles Lightning that's in the IBL, the International Basketball League, uh, called uh, me up and wanted to get together for lunch. Now, I thought it was just you know a, a lunch meeting so I could try to help bring in sponsors to, to help support the team that's uh, you know here in the Los Angeles area. But he knew my background, and he says, hey, do you think you can still lace them up? <laughs> Rock, Rock knows me pretty well, so he knows what the response is. He says, sure, I can lace them up. And so they wanted me, they wanted me to play one game, uh, just one game, uh, and they would promote that the state center was an athlete, and I got to play. And, and on this professional basketball team, there's eight former NBA players. Brian Russell, who played for the Jazz and the Lakers. If you know who Brian Russell is, he's the guy Jordan pushed off. There was a guy named Michael Jordan, something, you know, <laughs> that Jordan pushed off for his last bucket uh, uh, with the Bulls. Brian Russell played in three NBA finals. He's on our team. A guy, Toby Bailey, Tyus Edney, um, you know, Billy Knight, and Derek Martin all played for UCLA. A guy named Lamont Murray, who played for the Clippers and uh, was a lottery pick, played at Cal. Um, and then we have. Uh, a guy named Fred Vincent, who's now assistant coach of the Charlotte Hornets, but he played for the South Supersonics. And we have another guy named Joaquin Hawkins played for the Rockets. That's the kind of players we were playing with. And so they asked me to turn out uh, and practice. Uh, they called and they said, hey, well, do you want to practice with these guys? And I want to get in shape. I didn't want to embarrass myself. So I said, sure, absolutely. I love to practice. But after the second or third practice, coach and the owner came up to me and said, hey, can you meet us after practice? I thought I was going to get cut or something. <laughs> um, and they said, man, you can play ball. You can really play ball. Um, we'd like to offer you a contract for the full, 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 full year. And by the way, part of the deal is we know your job is the most important thing. Um, and we'll let you, you know, you come when you can. Uh, is what they left it. Because they knew my, my role as a state center, that has to be the top priority. But they were willing to give me that shot and that opportunity. And my first season in the IBL, they offered me a one-year contract. I had the best field goal percentage on the team. I wasn't the highest scorer, but I had the best field goal percentage, and I played my role, uh, which was uh, when they left me open, I hit the shot. And, uh, it did really well. We actually won the IBL championship. Uh, we went up to Canada and Edmonton and Seattle, uh, and we, we won the championship. And then they offered me a contract for the following year, and I played last year. Uh, we went to the quarterfinals. And now they just offered me another contract to play the next this this upcoming season. So there's not too many people out there that can say that they fulfilled both of their dreams at such an early age. Uh, I always wanted, you know, the, another thing at Whittier College, our first day when I walked on campus, they asked you what do you, what do you want, and I asked a lot of the kids here uh, that I, I introduced myself to, what what's your goals, what do you want to do? And I remember we had that the first day here at Whittier College, and they walked around. And they asked me, and I said, I want to be president of the United States. I hear all these laughing, <laughs> you know. And I said, well, what's everybody laughing at? You know, you know uh, again, I, I had confidence in, in that we're going to achieve what we want to achieve. Uh, and again, you, you can, your future is limitless. You're at a college right here that's one of the most renowned colleges in the country. You're all one of the top students at one of the most renowned colleges in the country, and you did that while being a student athlete, excelling on the field and the court. There's nothing that you can't accomplish. If you're here in this room today, there is nothing you can't accomplish if you're not willing, if you're willing to work hard to achieve that. You can be just like me, and 15, 20 years from now, you're going to give a speech back to Whittier College, 
and inspire, hopefully inspire uh, future generations to accomplish whatever you're going to accomplish. Um, I'm a living testament to you can achieve your dreams. I've achieved my two lifelong dreams, and I'm going to keep working hard to keep excelling because uh, you know that's the goal is to get the most out of life and, and leave your community in a better spot than what you found. And so with that, President, thanks for having me here today. Uh, Rob, thanks for having me here. Rock, thanks for your inspiration. And all the students. <laughs> President. Yes. Uh, a couple minutes ago, you talked about when you were here at orientation and you said, oh, I want to be president. Mm -hmm. it, it might be helpful for them to hear, is it all, if, do you think it's about creating that plan or is it taking advantage of opportunities or is it both? It's, it's, it's really all above. I mean, in, in, in life and politics, it's about timing as well. In, uh, look, I'm proud of what I've already done. If I didn't do anything else, I think I've done, I've left, I believe I've left the state in a better place than what I found it. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to keep working hard. But I, I'm very goal-oriented and I encourage all the students. I do this all the time and I revisit it. Um, I do a, 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 a monthly goal. I do a weekly goal, I do a daily goal, I do a yearly goal, a five-year, 10-year, and a 20-year plan. And yeah, you can always adjust that plan. But I think it's, if you don't know where you're going, uh, you can get lost. And I think it's important to know what you, you want in your achievements. Um, you know, and I have a personal life achievement uh, goal list and I have a professional life achievement goal list and I think it's very important. Um, uh, I'm a little on schedule, I would like to be ahead of schedule. So uh, I'm going to keep working hard to make sure that I get to the place that I think I can accomplish the most good. Um, and at any time, if I'm not having fun, I'm not doing what I think is right, or um, sometimes your passions change, uh, just like I'm sure a lot of you have changed majors uh, along the way, um, then you set your goals and you re readjust your plan. But I think it's very important to be goal oriented. Any other questions? Wait, someone in the back. Please. Uh, what did you do in between college and coming uh, on the assembly year? Good question. I, um, I, look, uh, my, my dad was a drill sergeant and my mom was an immigrant from Germany and we didn't have a lot of political connections, so to speak, and so I learned everything I could. And I wanted to give something that's value added. I always knew I wanted to run for office, even when I was here. And I said, what can I do to give value added to, to make sure that I, I was kind of a commodity that helped people and got my foot in the door. And so I thought every, every elected official uh, needs to get elected, um, every uh, public official. So I went to campaign schools. I learned everything you could about uh, how to help people get elected in, in campaigns. So I went to campaign schools in DC. I did you know uh, campaign schools here in California. And then I ended up running uh, a couple of different uh, candidates' campaigns. Uh, one is your congressman here, Gary Miller. Uh, I ran his campaign. Uh, Ed Royce, who's just over in Fullerton, I ran his first campaign for Congress. Um, and then down in San Diego, I ran a couple campaigns down there before I got elected. So um, I did what I could uh, just to you know, figure out and, and again, strategize on what's the best path in order to get to where I need to be. And uh, that's what I did. Uh, how does your family life fit in? Families, look, if, I, if I'm not a good dad, then everything else is out the door. Um, my little girl, Ruby Ruth, just turned five. Um, she's in kindergarten. Uh, actually, she turned five a little while ago, but um, she's five. She's in kindergarten, and my boy, we call him Tiny Tony. He's three. Uh, I just left uh, Tiny Tony. In fact, he had his Easter, Easter um, you know, egg hunt with, with his school, uh, his preschool. So I did that, and I carved out time to do that, and I sped right here to get here on time uh, for, for this speech. But Sundays, I don't do anything on Sundays. It's my family day. It's locked in. Um, unless there's something earth shattering that I have to be at, I, I leave Sundays as family time. And I do whatever I can to make sure I'm home as much as possible. It's tough. And I think it's the most difficult part of my job. Because my job takes me to Sacramento Monday through Thursday. I'm in Sacramento. Um, you know, We're up in session on Monday and Thursday. We have committee assignments on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So I'm away from my family. Um, and I come home on Thursday, and typically Thursday through Saturday, I have a lot of different meetings and stuff, but I do whatever I can to block in the time uh, to make the time uh, for my children. Because, uh, again, that's the toughest part of the job. And we're up in Sacramento uh, January through September, yeah. uh, Monday through Thursday. Do they come up and visit you? 
Well, when my wife was in the assembly, it was great. Uh, we flew, Southwest knew us really well. We, we, we flew as a family, uh, back and forth. And my wife turned out of the state assembly uh, this last cycle in 2010. So now my wife and kids, and it actually was good timing. My little girl just started kindergarten. So we didn't want um, to live up in Sacramento because I, I, I'm not from Sacramento. I'm from Ventura County. And I think if you're going to represent an area, you have to be you know, part of the community. And we're part of that community. I grew up there. And I thought it was very important that we, that we have our children go to, go to local community schools. You know, because a lot of congressmen uh, move their families back to Virginia. I understand why they do, because they don't want to, or even in Sacramento, because they don't want to miss out on that time. But I think they do a disservice to their community because they're not in the community. You can't represent a community if you're never there. So I saw some media reports about a challenge you issued to our current president. Yes. Do you think he'll ever uh, take that on? It's a no-win situation for a while. <laughs> uh, but you know what's interesting? I, I, I not only challenged him to a game, I don't know if you know this, but Obama put in a, a basketball court in the right, White House, right. and so I'd like to play there. So right. I challenged him. Yeah. And then I took it a little bit further. Uh, Don McClain, who I grew up with, we grew up together in Simi Valley. He's now an announcer for UCLA and the Clippers. But his part of UCLA, um, he talked to the head coach at Oregon State. Oh. The Oregon State head coach is uh, Michelle Obama's brother. So my, my guy, Don McClain, said, hey, my, my boy wants to take on uh, your brother-in-law. Can you make that happen? So we're trying to, we're trying to finagle it. I hope I get a chance to play Obama. I know I'll beat him if, if we do. Yeah, the Oxy with your rivalry. Yeah, Oxy, you know, it was funny. Um, uh, not Obama, but Jack Kemp also mm -hmm. went to Oxy, and I got to know Jack Kemp before he passed away. Every time I saw Jack Kemp, I, I went up to him and I said, uh, what's, what's wrong? You couldn't get into Whittier, so you went to Oxy? You know, and, and I always made fun of him, and I would say the same thing to Obama. You know, he couldn't get into Whittier, so he went to Oxy. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Again, thanks so much. I, I, I really uh, wish you nothing but the best in the future, and congratulations on your achievements thus far. Uh, it's really remarkable that you're a tremendous student-athlete, and uh, thanks for having me part of your program. Thank you. Thank you.